Warning. This video acts as a spin-off to a series of three docu-films in the making on this channel about Beethoven. Hello and uh, welcome to the Fondation des Etats-Unis. My name is Leo Marillier and I play the violin and I am a researcher in classical music. I was a resident at the Fondation des Etats-Unis for two years, between 2016 and 2018, and I'm really happy to be back here to be answering questions from colleagues and friends concerning Beethoven. It is true that his biographers have shown that his life was a heroic, heroic one, that he had a very romantic temperament. But the limits of the romantic temperament and then the romantic era, I think they are further than what we believe to be. Mozart called himself a romantic and the, rom made the romantic age of literature was before that of romanticism in music, the former being in the second half of the 18th, 18th century and, and the latter in the, the entire 19th century. But even there, even there the, it's muddy. It's muddy territory. It's very easy to reduce someone to a single um, point of view, to a single opinion, because then it makes it makes it all the easier to view according to this specter, according to this vision, the entirety of his life and his output. I think Beethoven had all three, but he was a modernist, even in his day and age. And the romantic temperament ran far longer than I think we believe to be. Um, and so does the classical. You know, I take a classical genius, a classical creator, because I don't buy the word genius, um, a classical temperament is someone who thinks about the structure of the work and the romantic temperament rather about the contents of the work. And of course with Beethoven these are both very prominent ideals. He had a romantic mind, he had other romantic minds, he was very much interested in everything related to romanticism as much as he was endowed with gifts for understanding the, the art of his own past, namely his passion for Handel or his study of 16th century counterpoint masters. The, the point with these questions is that I, I don't want to answer them. I think all of them are very interesting I don't want to answer because I don't think there is an answer. And I mean, I, I can't provide you with one. Maybe, I don't know, maybe, but I'm not even certain. Some people can give you specific answers. But concerning Beethoven's affiliation with romanticism, it also stems from an entire age, the whole 19th century, which made him a god to their own temperament, a beacon at the end of the Enlightenment, which is a strange thing. What, how, how would romantic composers have reacted to the classical era were it not for Beethoven? I think that's 
an, another interesting question, which relates to the whole romanticism, modernism. I wish that there were an answer, and Beethoven didn't want to give us one, because he never stated when he was. I think he was a classicist at heart, even though there is a quote by uh, Anton Herrenzweig in uh, The Hidden Order of Art, um, which goes something like this. The bravest act a man can do is to bring into consciousness with consciousness's means unconscious material. Beethoven did that, and I don't think people before him did that. Or did that with this much clarity and, uh, and this little classicism. I mean, the, I, I think the entire late period, what we call late period, is all about that. It's about expanding the territory covered by unconscious material through the invention of new melodies or new voice leading, kind of like Schumann. So in this way, he, yes, he is romantic, but I wouldn't call him a genius either. Um, I mean, he was, but that didn't stop him from going further than the simple status of a genius. There were things, um, struggles inside of him, which were only expanded by the onset of his illness. There were many things already latent in his temperament, you know, and um, a rather negative outlook on life, um, his own interest with spirituality, um, Good himself said, well, is claimed to have said because it's a conundrum to, to understand the relationship between Beethoven and Goethe. But Goethe is said to have declared that Beethoven was doubly deaf, twice deaf, first in his own world and then with his illness. However, I think that there are a number of tools which he would not have had access to without the loss of his hearing. He wouldn't have gone as far. He would have gone in the same direction, but not as far. This is also, of course, a mystery question. <laughs> But there is something unsettling in what I just said. Does, does it mean that the, the, that the foundations of the classical style and that of Beethoven's own style were already crumbling in a way before his illness? Was there something that drove music itself with, from within? to fall down and reach the heights, in a way, that Beethoven worked on. Speaking of the, of the tools which he found, thanks to his deafness, or in spite of his deafness, I would say that we would not have scores as clear as they are um, the written sign is a strange language, especially for music, because music usually suffices itself in sound, in phenomena. But Beethoven had the exact opposite in an era where improvisation was queen. He had an, an, an accident of reliance on the musical written sign, on the graphic act of writing much more than his contemporaries. And 
And I think that changed a lot of things for him because he didn't realize the functional power of sound. He realized other parameters as important. I think that with Beethoven, harmony takes less of a leading, of a leading hand in musical form in favor of dynamics. That's my main, very personal thesis. Being unable to hear sounds in a precise way for a long time, he could not, I think, distinguish a tonic from a dominant or a submediant from um, a leading tone. Yes, Beethoven did work a lot. But there are many pieces which he wrote in very short amounts, amounts of time. There are many written improvisations. There are many things which he left to the freedom of the composer. Of course, this changes little by little in his life, but even late. I think, given his prowess, he could have I mean, c composition starts with improvisation. You don't start in your head at, at the time. I don't think a composer started with, oh, I have a sonata in mind. No, it, it doesn't start with the whole picture of the three movements. It just starts with an idea, little by little, you know, starting with microstructures, um, small bits of... Um, of light, of musical light, which kind of pave the, pave the way through a certain structure. But, you know, in, in, in the case of the late piano sonatas and string quartets, he didn't think of his own relationship to sonata form, because sonata form just didn't exist as a template at the time. It wasn't codified until well into the 19th century. And so Beethoven just had an idea of, oh, why not put a little fugue here? Or you know, why not put a, a remnant of the introduction, put it back? You know, that's what happens with some of the piano sonatas. The pathétique, for example. In the case of Mozart, I mean, he was compared to Mozart because they were both incredible improvisers and performers. I think Mozart did work a lot because he wrote a lot. I, I don't think there should be a, a hierarchy between the two in terms of accomplishment. They're both extremely different. Mozart was, was very much a um, stage-oriented composer. And he did work a lot on those. Beethoven was much more akin to Haydn in, that, in the sense that he was attached to the formal qualities of work, but also to the fantasy of pure sound instead of the fantasy of evoking a certain character or a certain word. He wasn't a word painter. He, he himself said it, it's just, he was a painter of moods, not of words. That's what he said about the Pastoral Symphony, and I, I mean, it has to be true, and we have to trust him on this. And, okay, this links to a few other questions but we have much more information about Beethoven's personal life and personal life as a composer than we have for Mozart. We have pretty much every sketch Beethoven made thanks to his secretaries and the people who followed him um, in, his, in his career.
And for Mozart, we just have the finished products. We don't exactly know for certain. I mean, we know that he has, he wrote some pieces extremely quickly. Um, but that doesn't give him credit, in a way, for the genius. Um, musical concep conception did, in fact, change, probably, because of the influence that Beethoven retrospectively had on the classical era. Because we entered in the 19th century with an age of communication, of transmission, rather than, rather than just um, expression. So the, the products, in a way, in the 19th century, and starting with Beethoven, had to be, in a way, more impacted by the act of reworking, that they had to be more mediated by the act of working out a specific detail in a work so that it could be more easily understood. Because, I mean, don't get me wrong, Beethoven's music is far stranger than Mozart's. And that's precisely because of that. Because he, he wanted, in a way, I think, to estrange the work from its own era, from its own cocoon. And it's something which Mozart didn't think about, which wasn't in the minds of people at the time. We have to be very careful <laughs> with that question because I think too much has been said already. We say stuff about Shostakovich, Prokofiev, I don't know, Poulenc. Um, the 20th century was an age of, was the age of a very singular recession in that we stripped off classicism and that composers did away with the structures that go on top of the material. Instead, they focus on the material at the level of the material, which is, I call this the organic temperament, because an organic work is one in which you can follow the entire course of the work by listening to very s small elements of the musical discourse. In this regard, Bartok is an interesting case because he has both the large architectures that late Beethoven incites us to use and he also has hints of an organic thinking where we can follow the, you know, the, the chirping little insects and the and the, 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 the microcosmos. And I think that stems from Beethoven. Beethoven grinds down musical material. And Bartok, I think, grinds it back up. He takes it where Beethoven left it, you know, at the very end of the Opus 111 sonata, or in the ornaments of, uh, the, of, the, last, of, the, um, of the last few Diaboli variations and he builds up an entire fol folklore around these little hints of musical material and he makes entire works out of it. I have to say, I, I, I don't think anybody in the generation, in the golden generation of the 1920s, so Stockhausen, Boulez, Maderna, Ligeti, Courtag, Berriot. I don't think any of these really wanted to 
use this kind of thinking, not for dramatic purposes. Bartok still did it for dramatic purposes, this organic thinking, this I'll take the material from the ground up and build from the ground up while still being able to listen to this musical ground, to use uh, perhaps misplaced um, semiological word. However, one quality which I think didn't escape this generation is the fact that Beethoven's music has some of the more striking contrasts ever set to music. That there is an entire world contained within these extremes which he used and he used very dramatically. And in that case, Boulez does use that also dramatically in the second sonata. You know, it's been linked before to the hammer clavier. I think because of that, not because of the, of the form of, or because of the counterpoint. I think it just comes down to this kind of thinking. And Boulez had a very organic view of his own music in that he wanted to integrate within the work, within the structure of the work, the conception of the work. So kind of a meta reading where the work um, is present at its own birth. You know, pli selon pli. starts with a, a cry, not, a, not even a cry, just a, a shout of incredible joy, which I personally relate to the, the very opening of the, the Hammer Clavier Sonata, which doesn't have much to do with the rest of the sonata, but from which the, the rest of the work will stem from. In a more modern era, I don't know and I don't pretend to know everything that's been done in the last 20 years in terms of music. However, I've had first-hand experience with some of, I think, the best music that came out recently. The relationship I have with Beethoven, as I'm sure many performers do, is a physical one, a tactile one where you can sense a form of, um, of danger, even though you know how the piece is going to work out, there is always something in your, in, your, in your mind that says, that's an uneven piece of work, that's exaggerated, that's too much. Where does this lead? And I've had that feeling with a work by Rebecca Saunders, which I advise you to listen to if you can, I had the luck of performing this with the people who premiered it, the Duty Mastering Quartet, when I was placing their second violin Constance. And we performed it, it's called Unbreathed, it's inspired by, between others, Beckett, which has, I think, Beckett has a relationship with Beethoven. I think he does. And this work by Rebecca Saunders reminded me, like, the first time I heard it, first of all, I was, bawling. <laughs> I was just laughing because I had found the, um, <laughs> the sequel, I don't know. I mean, if the Grosse Fou is a new hope, yeah, Unbreathed is The Empire Strikes Back. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
It's just absolutely incredible, unrelenting, very much innovative in its, ge in its gestion of form. Because Unbreathed finishes with a, an entire section made out of very slow moving um, remains of music, like a, <laughs> a corpse or a ghost flying around. And this reminds me very much of some of the inter intermediate, intermediate sections in uh, the Grosse Fugue. And then, of course, there is this entire middle section, which is uh, sort of ostinato, but which just keeps breaking and building up again. It's, it's very fiery in that it renews the material as, as fast as it burns it down. And that's also something that happens in the Grosse Fugue and which I fail to see anywhere else. It's all about the relationship between Beethoven's inner world, inner development as a composer, and how it coincides with the evolution and the evolution of the instruments at the time. And I say evolution with brackets, because instruments weren't evolving at the time. They were changing. The instruments had trials and errors. The state of piano making at the time was very, very different. Most of the pianos in England had metal frames when French ones didn't and German, Austrian ones didn't either. French pianos had a pedal, whereas Austrian and German ones had a system of, of, a, of a lever under the piano that you had to, to, um, to press your, your knee against in order to lift the, 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 lift the damps. It was therefore much easier to play with the pedal in, on a French piano than on an Anglo-Saxon one. Um, the history of Beethoven's pianos and his acquisition, his interest is widely documented. And I think better than, if anything, just wanted to do away with this form of I'm writing that piece for that piano. I think he had an inkling, thanks to his deafness once more, that there needed to be a center in all of this. And this is related to the next question. I've started to go into the details of this. <laughs> it's a wormhole. It's actually very interesting. Although it's, it, it is difficult to, to figure out because Dragonetti met Beethoven when he was very, ve when Beethoven was very early in his career. So we, we don't exactly know how he wrote for double bass before. Although I have a couple of theories, uh, specifically concerning the tuning of double basses at the time and Dragonetti. I don't know if Dragonetti used his three string double bass when playing with the Royal Philharmonic Society or if he used 
a four strings one, which in which in which case the tuning might be different. But I think that there are instances in Beethoven's work, specifically a place in the Ninth Symphony. <laughs> I think Beethoven had spe specifically in mind the Venice tu tuning for the double bass with an F sharp, which would allow to make these very large jumps much more easily than on a more traditional uh, G D uh, E A D G tuning. This is pure speculation. It's just my own thoughts about it. It's otherwise well documented and it, it proved to be a very very interesting read. Um, this also comes from you know, me being a violin player and being very interested in the double bass because it provides the core to the orchestral sound. And in the case of Haydn, the double bass is half of the time turned toward the string section, but the rest of the time they turn toward the brass and the timpani section, at least in the late symphonies, uh, specifically I have in mind, the, the first movement of uh, 103 in E flat. Um, but for Beethoven this changes completely, he, make, he entirely turns it around toward the string, sec the string section, with of course some exceptions. but. Uh, what also concerns me is, is the range that he asks, because I know that in the Eroica Symphony there are many low E-flats, especially in the first movements, but these can't be accessed. So, yeah, that, that was a big question for me. It made me realize, did Beethoven actually know the... Uh, in, was the range of the double bass at the time really officialized or or set straight, or did, just, did orchestras just have different ways of tuning? So that's another very interesting question. I, I know that Dragonetti was very proficient on the double bass, and I've, I've looked at the, at the cello sonata which he played when he first met Beethoven, and Beethoven played with him. It was the G minor sonata, and the last movement has arpeggios, sort of arpeggios, bariolage is what I would call them. And probably that would um, have indeed opened Beethoven's mind's eye to the actual possibilities of the double bass as an instrument capable of harmonic and melodic motion of which he hadn't heard about because, you know, in Haydn, except that symphony where there is a solo, um, there isn't much in terms of double bass playing. Um, I think pizzicati are also something I... I mean, pizzicati in general are something I, I cherish because it's so... it's such a wide spectrum for string instruments, it's specifically the double bass, and Beethoven probably would have loved to experiment with this. <laughs> Also, kind of the same as the, with the, p the preceding question with the pianos, there is this biographical side to his search and his discovery of the double bass as an actual independent instrument, 
and his in growing interest with the lower register of the orchestra and of the piano. His deafness allowed him to hear things which are much harder to hear when you have a normal sense of hearing, an unharmed sense of hearing. And one of these is a turnaround of the dynamic power of different registers, independent on the instrument. And this goes in the same way as the piano is going lower as well as higher, but lower in the register in Beethoven using this with incredible genius. And this also, I think, ties this to his change of orchestral writing, which is less centered around the melody and more around the relationship between the melody and the bass, which is, I mean, it's everywhere in his writing, uh, this relationship, this search for a new way of leading the voices, uh, making the basses sing, you know, the Ninth Symphony, or making the, the basses roar. I think there are many instances where even though Beethoven writes something precise, I think there just needs to be, you know, it's a, an effect of the ear. I think there are many uh, symptoms of, um, of hearing loss that we have to relate to the phenomena of music with Beethoven and one of them, I will, I must look into it, but uh, there is something in hearing low register sounds which sort of blurs the frontiers between some tones. Um, when played at a certain dynamic, some pitches can sound not, can, can sound different than what they actually are. And I think that's something Beethoven realized. And he, the, 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 the metaphor of fire, you know, of rumbling once more, I think was, was very much present with Beethoven when composing the Missa Solemnis, which has lots of very interesting, the relationship between the organ part, the bass part as singers, and the double bass parts. I mean, it's such a low register and the double bassoon. And same goes in the Ninth Symphony. And I think, yeah, Beethoven wanted to shift around, um, shift away from the melodic importance given by Mozart to, to music and go back to a more medium range, medium, lower middle range of, of, of the orchestral texture. And some spots in the Ninth Symphony, for me, point the way toward this. And also might be because it was easier to explore the lower registers than the higher registers because violin players used gut strings. So, I mean, good luck trying to make, you know, a, a whole section of first violins play a high D together. That's just pretty awful, I think. In Greek, there are naturally longer sounds, vowels and consonants. There is a long E and E, and, e, and there is a short S and a longer S, a short, sorry, a short O and a longer O, and a short E and a longer E. That probably showed bit on the way toward building up Um, building rhythmic material, building material, just straight down material, from the ground up, beginning with having to do precise calculations. Um, that's, I think, that's what, what I think most of his sketches are about. It's about trying to clarify the bottom level of musical understanding, of musical hearing just trying to figure out what the hell to do with uh, 16th notes and the, the, the rest just makes itself, creates itself. Um, 
as for the anecdote with the Iliad, I mean, it's just written in his, uh, in his diaries that he was looking and reading some verses of the Iliad and even using it uh, as um, sort of an argument for one of his choral works. It's, uh, but, but, it, but it, 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 it's anecdotical. But it is proof that Bedouin was passionate about this. Um, he used the principle of Greek poetry and metric in his own music, even though there is no trace of what the original rhythms uh, were supposed to well, what the text was, but he knew what the relationship was between certain rhythms and certain emotions. You know, this, it, with this, this was at a time when uh, there was an entire code between um, keys and emotions, between what, yeah, what, what, what keys uh, evoke suffering, uh, evoke you know, merry stuff, invoke nature, uh, and probably Beethoven wanted to do the same. And he did it, but not just by himself, because everybody was just so in love with him in the 19th century, everybody just kept using those rhythms the way Beethoven had, and, and so we end up with, you know, a hundred years of, uh, of romantic music, which uses as <laughs> basis for anything that is remotely triumphant, which I, I'm, a, I, I'm not bitter. <laughs> I'm, I'm just. It, it is strange. I mean, the, the Romantic era was an age of stagnation. We know a lot about Bedouin's personal life, and we try to shove it its way through to his creative life. Uh, sometimes with good reason, but a private man reminds a private man, and fortunately or unfortunately, we do have everything pretty much that he has read. We know what he read. We know what was on his, uh, on his desk. You know, we, we, he had engravings of Isis, the, the, the Egyptian, the, 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 the Egyptian goddess. I think he was a, very much a man of his time. He had lots of Greek-inspired and Enlightenment writings. He had he had learned Latin, and he wanted to learn Greek. Good luck. Um, he was aware of Indian philosophy, of excerpts from the Rig Veda. God is immaterial. Also, are we powerless to represent his image? Because he is invisible, amorphous. But due to what he gave us to behold in his work, we are allowed to conclude his eternal omniscient, omnipotent character, his universal presence. To the all-powerful and to him only, envy and cupidity are strangers. His greatness has no equal. Brahma, he absorbed his own spirit. Him, the powerful, we find his presence in. His omniscience emanates from his own inspiration, and his own conception includes all others. Of all those polycomprehensive qualities, the greatest is omniscience. To her, there is no trinity, for she is absolutely independent. O oh God, you are the true light, benefactory, eternal, of all time, in all places. Your wisdom accepts thousandfold and thousand
while you still act freely in your honor. Everything that we adore, you preceded it. Therefore, to you our thanks, and to you our adoration. Only you are the blissful Bhagavan. You, the essence of all laws, the, the image of wisdom. All, we feel your presence, and you hold everything. Um, he had an admiration for philosophy as an enlightenment feature, as the main feature. You know, he himself said he wanted to become a philosopher, as you rightly said. Um, but there is, there is a difference between being a philosopher in your own private life and people in the future turning your life and your creative life into a philosophy. Uh, um, I think it's kind of one of the problems with Beethoven having a sort of luck in the fact that we have everything by him. We have stuff that he copied. Um, I, I, I would redirect you, I mean, I'm, it, it, it's, it's known, it's, it is published, it can be found, what his pensions were in terms of philosophy, literacy, Goethe mainly. Um, although I, I wish he had known Hölderlin. Yeah, one of the main sources is, there are a couple of chapters in Maynard Solomon's Late Beethoven, which is uh, fantastic, fantastic, fantastic book about music in general, but life even more generally, because it really shows the inner depths of Beethoven's character, his search, um, the in incredible intricacies of, of his own creative life. And there are a few chapters devoted to his interest with uh, Masonic literature and rituals, I think some of his works do bear um, a metaphorical sense in that they have a philosophical message instead of a philosophical meaning. I would say the Eroica Symphony, the Waldstein Symphony in a way, which I would relate to uh, French philosophy. The Ninth Symphony has very um, clear, in a way, links with Kant. Uh, because Schiller's text um, is very much in the zeitgeist of uh, Kant's phenomenology of the spirit. It's difficult at the moment to distinguish between writings about Beethoven which are sort of entertainment, um, which are, you know, delving into his personal life, but which doesn't, don't exactly make, make a point. Which is why I'm trying to stay, uh, to stay quiet and not say too much about what his actual literary and philosophical li uh, references were. Mm. The music is far, is far enough for me um, in terms of uh, growth. And I, I, say, I, I guess I would say this even, though I, even, even if I weren't a musician. Um, there are... Yes, and, and Beethoven was nonetheless a stereotypical, enlightened, turn-of-the-century guy. Um, he wanted to be part of an intellectual elite, which, you know, this quest was everywhere with, you know, the resurgence of, um, of Masonic lodges, of um, a form of uh, straightforward spirituality. He delved into it himself. He, he, he made a few metaphorical works. Some of them are shattering and others are what they are, a, a product of the time, beautifully made. Uh, you know, it's the cantata which he wrote when he was young.
This is a very large question, but it is fascinating because it changes over time. He was obviously a perfectionist. He wanted to make more simple music for every work. More simple is, I mean, it's, it's a strange epithet because Beethoven's music is, isn't, it's not simple. Um, what he meant by that is that he wanted to bring forth as much material with few means. You see that in Beethoven there is something of um, a formal thinking as in formal logic contrasts within his work uh, to be very clear. Um, I think he did away with appoggiaturas and ornamentation or gave a structural word to ornamentation because he wanted to he wanted to essentialize his own music and so the criticism that which he made about his own work is, I mean, it, it, I think it's all about that. He realized that he was going somewhere, and he did go somewhere. Um, but he just kept getting further and down to the rabbit hole. There are a few specific examples of what he thought. He thought that uh, his C sharp minor swing quartet was his best. When he was writing, it was either the Waldstein or the Appassionata Sonata. On the sketches, he writes simpler, 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 which, I mean, once more, it's... <sighs> These are difficult questions because you, you want to get into the life of the man, but I don't want to get stuck there. I don't want to get stuck just talking about what he thought and instead talking about what he did. Beethoven was a far less linear composer than we give him credit for. We, we think of him as you know, always on this metaphysical quest for uh, you know, brotherhood and humanity and generosity. No, he was just a composer. <laughs> I mean, at the end of the day, when he went to bed, talking about his personal life, when he went to bed, he didn't think, Oh, I have to, to do my duty as a human being uh, tomorrow. Uh, no, no, no. I, I think he was just, okay, tomorrow I have to, 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 to be done with uh, this page. Otherwise, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to jump, jump off from the window. I'm saying it's not linear because he came back in a way. You know, he did some advances in a direction. But then, in a work that comes after, he would do something different. So isn't this a way of... What I'm trying to say is that he changed his mind about quite a few things. Or he just wanted to go to a different direction. I don't think Beethoven was much keen on looking at his own work after he finished it. Instead of trying to push himself forward and not think about what had come before. Um, which is why, I mean, I'd say we have relatively little about the topic you're asking. He didn't care about it, and I think that's, that's a lesson in a way.
So this is related to the preceding question. <sighs> Formal logic, that's, I think, the word I used earlier. Okay, uh, Beethoven was, had a very formal education, nothing too fancy. He didn't go to university. I think he probably stopped school at around 14 or 15, maybe. I don't know, maybe even earlier. He probably knew a little bit about basic fifth grade algebra. I don't think it goes further than that. Um, I don't think he read Leibniz, you know, or Newton. Um, but there are many things in his music which I wouldn't say borrow because he didn't borrow, let's be clear. Um, what, what, in, what really interests me with, uh, with Beethoven's composition style is the art of iteration, not repetition. The art of iteration and, uh, and translation in a, in a mathematical sense. Um, of trying to fit a musical object with certain properties, trying to project it, project, project it through time. Beethoven was very much aware of this, I think, because he was deaf, and so he could only see his music written and he struggled, he strove to get his own music across the arrow of time and he did it, he did it by getting from the ground up, so finding very small um, cells, I wouldn't even call them themes cells and trying to see from point A to point A plus zero 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 one what happens there following on a very very deep level the the, the becoming of material instead of having a one Having one eight bar phrase followed by another, uh, we have to start at a lower, a lower stage of musical, deeper stage of musical understanding, so lower and higher at the same time. And we also know that composers, many composers before and after him, had uh, inklings of mathematical thought in their own compositions you know, symmetry with Bach, the golden proportion with Bartok, harmonic proportions with the entire spectralist movement. Uh, you know, with Schoenberg, it's all about uh, flow, uh, yeah, the, the, the mechanics of uh, fluidity of material and with Beethoven, I think it's about rupture and continuity. How can a musical object be kept alive while not staying the same as in the preceding movement? And this is my point about 131, Opus 131, the string quartet. The material is the same. It's just in, a, in such, for every movement, it's just such in a different light for each movement, that it, it, it doesn't even register as sharing qualities of tone. You know, I, I, a very interesting theory about all, all of music, huh? really, really all of music, but specifically Beethoven, is homeomorphism. The, the, the concept of transformation, of uh, uh, vectorization, of music throughout the form, throughout the four movements of the form, and for Beethoven, everything just plays into that level, and 
there is a, a great level of fantasy for each one of his multi-movement works, because for each multi-movement works, he finds uh, of his multi-movement works, he finds a different solution in terms of the overall architecture and the inner workings of the material. And these, while seemingly unrelated parameters, they are actually very much linked. And it's it's all about yeah finding. Uh, identity or difference and I'm once again I'm not talking about repetition I think repetition is a word that is far too much uh, far too overused with his works no the, there are not three eras with Beethoven there are turning points, yeah, there are turning points. The Opus 30 and Opus 31, uh, violin and piano and violin and piano sonatas. Probably around Opus 95, 96, 97, there is also something that happens. I think, you know, don't think about a bit of it in terms of linearity. However, at each of these accepted limits to each of these, era, of, of, of these eras. So the, the early period, the heroic period, and then the late period. For each one of these, th you can subdivide them into three subgroups, and that's where, it get, that's where it gets interesting, because for each of these periods, he starts off with writing piano music. Piano sonatas, piano variations, And, well, with the exception of the late era, of course. Some of the late era. He always starts, yeah, by writing for piano, where formal innovation isn't exactly there. But instead, innovation is crammed into a transition, into a specific theme, and it just, and he just leaves it at that. The second step, second subgroup for each of these eras, orchestra, concerto, where these little innovations, which were in the piano music, within the constraints of a specific region of the, of the score now are all over the music. They are thrown and shown around to the whole world. Brotherhood, humanity, blah, blah, blah. And then he turns to chemi music where the innovation is much more elusive. It's everywhere and it's, it's nowhere because there is a a, a higher le sense of narrative um, that's not just about the, the birth of innovation, but it's about the works are often about the, the birth of the work itself instead of the, 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 the bringing forth of a specific theme or a, a specific innovation. In Beethoven, there are also works which are not to be taken into account, I think. Circumstance works, alimentary <laughs> works, and I don't know, I, I, I don't want to call these supreme works, but they are works that don't fit in any of these categories, even though they are, you know, for piano, for the quartet, they, they, they aren't. Um, one of these works, one of the works that should not be taken into account is the last string quartet. I don't think it's a fourth era. I don't think. I think it's doing away with many things indeed, but it's not exactly stating something new. Um, it's very innovative, of course. The format is both 
familiar and strange. Um, but for me, and I think I share this with a few of uh, a few Bedouin scholars, there are two works which do not fit at all in any of these categories. Um, the Hammerklavier Sonata. The Hammerklavier is just completely beyond human understanding. The Grosse Fugue is, however, very much part of this uh, tripartition of, 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 of his creative life. But the Hammerklavier, even though it might seem to be the closest work to the Grosse Fugue, the Hammerklavier isn't, because the innovation is constant at every level, and it's also very much localized in a way. Uh, the famous case with the, the, the two introductory notes to the, to the third movement. I wouldn't even try to classify this. Classifying isn't thinking. And another work is the Quartetto Serioso, for different reasons, because it's a work which has a very strange tone overall, which uh, doesn't try to solve anything. On the contrary, it just tries to blow everything up voluntarily with the tempo, with uh, the motion between the movements, with this tripartite third movement, He, 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 he wasn't start satisfied with, uh, with stars, specifically. Uh, I know this for the violin, uh, because he gave the violin concerto to Franz Clément, and Franz Clément bolstered it up, and bit of a change, the dedication um, left the work to die, in a way. Tried to salvage it, sorry, that's a plane. The technical... What bothers me with Beethoven's relationships with his performers is that often their own technical prowess influenced his composition. Beethoven manages most of the time to nonetheless make a certain composition uh, bearable, open <laughs> uh, to performance by other players but it is a very risky bet. And I wouldn't put the question any forward. I would just stop the question there. Um, because once again, I want to talk about the music and not just the biography of who he hung out with. Although, Ignaz Schupansich, who was the person who gave Beethoven violin lesson early in his life, and went on to premiere all the string quartets. Even though he wasn't very proficient and Beethoven had to change some of the late quartets and not others, which is kind of, it's kind of strange because on the one hand, there are absolutely unplayable things, even for today, uh, or completely crazy ideas. The, the trio from uh, the Opus 135 quartet how could he play that? I mean, even, even for today, it's daring. It's a daredevil. And at the same time, Schupansich has Beethoven for some passages, namely, famously, the, the coda to the Opus 127, to lower the tempo so that he'll play the notes. And so it's, it's a strange relationship because, because sometimes it's like, okay, yeah, we, we, can, we, can, we can, yeah, I can, I can do that. And, and other times it's like, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry, I can't. So it's a strange relationship, I don't think there should be any answers to this. And even though I say that there, that these performers' uh, technique influenced Beethoven's compositions, of course it goes the other way. So this is very much related. What pace should we play? Should we play at slower tempi so that everybody can be understood? Or should we play it at the tempi that Beethoven imagined it? You know, those crazy, crazy composer tempi, which uh, he, I think, very much cared about. Ah, it's a 
tricky question. I like playing fast, not because I get to play fast, I mean, I don't think it's easy. I mean, I like to play what's fast, fast, and what's slow, slow, just because it gets the architecture in the forefront. If everything is played as a sort of moderato, I don't care much about it. You know, I don't feel much about it. I don't sense anything. You know, once again, it's that tacti tactile link you need to have with music in general, but since we're talking about Beethoven, I have to talk about Beethoven. I, I, I think speed is okay, specifically because our lives are so much faster than they used to be, so to, you know, sort of uh, render, I mean, no, even beyond that, but, you know, just to render the feeling that at a time an allegro and brio could be, uh, could have, you need to, to really give yourself to, to the music, and this is related once more to instruments, to the ability to unite within a work and within the instrument the overall grand architecture and very quickly moving uh, appoggiaturas, um, details of writing. You know, it's all about integrating this ineffable, this elusive material into the bigger scheme of things without making the elusive um, perceptible. I think we need to have a form of mystery in his music, a form of restraint in a way. We can't give everything, but we can give some, you know, we can give the tempo, but we can, you know, Beethoven, Beethoven's music is a conflict between different ways of thinking about music. The harmonic thinking, the melodic thinking, the dynamic thinking, and the structural thinking. And so there needs to be that conflict between the four uh, cardinal points within the performer and within the listener. We have to sense that there is an urgency, that there is something crucial at hand because it's concerning the entirety of the classical language. It's concerning the foundations, the relationship. It's like, oh my God, that melody could have gone this way, but it didn't because the harmony went this way, but the harmony didn't even go this way because the dynamic just kept going down and you know, things like this. Um, for me, the, the, the key to experiencing this kind of feeling is by staying true to the tempo, however doable they may be. Uh, I don't think we should care about uh, mishaps. No, I, I think these works of art, they overcome us and we should not try to say that we control them. I think it's stupid. They have to push us. Music as an art, Orpheus. Orpheus goes into the underworld because he is a musician. He goes where he dares not go because he is a musician. I know this is the metaphysical... Uh, there must be a form of necessity to music and for me at the moment, and I might of course change my mind and uh, I have probably changed it since I started uh, thinking about this question. Um, uh, we have to play with other means than our own. We have to be taken away. It's the only way to replicate this sense of, of, of freedom, in a way, into the listener. I don't want to answer the question. It's too much left to taste. difficult especially nowadays with you know the advent of generalized recordings 
Um, what I, one of the main dimensions in Beethoven's music, I think, is sometimes lacking. It's the dynamic contrast, which is not possible on a CD. You have to find a form of equilibrium between the soft and the loud. And so I, I can't judge. I, I can't judge. I can't do much about my lack of opinion about this. Um, although I do remain open, I am not against playing on grand pianos. I'm not against playing on epinets. <laughs> good luck. Good luck playing uh, <laughs> 111. Um, I'm not against anything. I'm just open for surprises. And I think surprises is what we need at the moment. This is probably, I mean, I, this is the question that is closest to me. Because the act of writing implies a very different thinking from, um, from performing and from, um, yeah. Beethoven was mainly an improviser. And so he sort of found a dead end when he came to deafness. But then he was an improviser with written music. And so you can find, he, he was kind of a fetishist, yeah, of the written sign. I mean, he, he, he devised a, that's my theory, it's shared by others not shared by others, by some others, others. Um, he devised his own dynamic uh, scheme for his own works, more and more toward, to, towards the end of his life, in his manuscripts. Um, and as I was saying at the beginning, there is a shift, there is a shift in, in, in his works, uh, and, and, and from before and after him, uh, it just changes. We stop being, doing descriptive markings and instead we start doing prescriptive markings, which shows once more the conflict between the different types of thinking within music, which Beethoven, I think, fully realized when he became deaf, between harmony, melody, dynamic, structure. These all came to an equilibrium in his mind when he stopped being able to hear. Um, when I say that Beethoven was an improviser, even though he was deaf, I really mean it because there are some discrepancies between different versions of a work. So the, it keeps, you know, grinding his gears. Some so, so, some works, you know, the the last two chords of the first movement of the E flat major piano sonata, uh, Opus Thirty One, Number Three. We don't know if it's piano or forte, and there are other issues which many keyboard players specifically might know about. Um, he, 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 he kept a mind at, uh, in constant activity, even though he also kept on writing. Um, and also not being able to hear what could have happened. He would have lost the sense of um, the back and forth between tonic and dominant, opening him to new rhythmic doors of perception. Um, therefore, the act of writing down you know, ledges in a way or slurs it does have a different meaning with him than with others, because with Haydn and Mozart, the, the act of writing is the act of ending a work. 
Once it's written, it's done. What's written is what came before it, it was the improvisation, it was the thinking. And for Beethoven, I think it goes both ways. Uh, his compositions both st stop at the, at, the st at the stage of writing and publishing, but they continue because of this very strange you know, prescriptive quality, because of the, the paradoxes that you can find in his works. Um, I mean, his manuscripts, they, they carry things which can't be found in any other composers, I think. And, and I think that's that. And there are things that cannot be solved by just looking at the score, that there are <laughs> sometimes ethical decisions you have to make about the music. Ethical decisions meaning also as, you know, as, as an interpret. It just stops there, stops there. You know, ethical decision, what do I choose to bring forth? Is it the harmonic motion? Is it the slurs? Is it the melodic motion? Is it the structure? That's an, an ethical question. And I don't think it existed with such magnitude, such importance before him. Thanks for watching.